Well, what a privilege it is to be uh, able to join with you on this uh, weekend uh, in FCC in Perth. Hallelujah. I want to thank you, Pastor Benny, for this uh, invitation uh, to speak uh, to your people. I'm delighted. I'm delighted. You know, uh, 2020 was uh, a, a staggering year, I think, for everybody. I, I don't think uh, any one of us in our wildest imaginations would have dreamt that something like this uh, would have happened. But it did, and I think that we learned to roll with the punches and have come out stronger uh, than ever before. Uh, but I believe that 2021 is going to be different. It's really going to be different. And I'm really privileged to be here with you. And on behalf of all the uh, family uh, here in Singapore, the Cornerstone Churches, uh, not just in Singapore, but globally, we want to bless you and thank you for the privilege uh, of co-laboring with us in the harvest field. Amen. My text today is Acts chapter 4 and verses 32 to 33, and this is an astounding, astounding passage of Scripture. Uh, let me just read it to you. It says, Now the multitudes of those who believed were one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and great grace was upon them. Watch this, great power and great grace, amen. You know, the God we serve is a supernatural God, amen. And the Bible we read and love is a supernatural book. You take out the supernatural from the Bible, listen, we don't have a Bible, amen. You take out the supernatural from Christianity, we don't have a Christianity. The only Christianity in the Bible was a supernatural Christianity. The only Christianity that the early church practiced was a supernatural Christianity and everything else is a poor imitation. Amen. And everything that they did in the first century was infused with the supernatural, with signs and wonders, with power, with miracles, and with, with dreams and visions. It's amazing. Amen. Now, I, I personally don't like theory because there's no such book in the Bible. Woo! Amen. There's no book of theory, all right? There's no theory, only possibilities. Amen. And uh, we only have a book of Acts. We only have a book of Acts. And I don't know how people can actually believe that the day of miracles are over. Come on, man. If you have two eyes, just open them and see, look around you and see what God is doing. He's still alive and He's still doing miracles and performing mighty miracles. Amen. Now, Christianity is not theory. It's not philosophy. It's not head knowledge. It is an experience and we must stop trying to do anything in ch our churches Without the, uh, the, the supernatural in it, we got to rely on the power of God, amen. And our, our faith has to be anchored in the unseen, amen. Nothing ought to be done with human strength or human ability because the flesh profits nothing but the Spirit gives life, amen. One Chinese pastor visiting America one time said he remarked at how much the American church has accomplished without God. Think about that for a few moments. Billy Graham once said that if God went on a long vacation, 90% of the churches would still continue business as usual, and that's scary. We cannot let that happen in our churches, man. We've got to go back to that source of life, amen. We've got to draw from that live stream and be joined to the vine, amen. We've got to come back to a place of total dependency with God, amen. Now, we're an uncommon people, amen. We're living in a very uncommon time. We serve an uncommon God, and uh, we are, who's about to do some amazingly outrageous, uncommon things. Come on. Now, in the book of Acts, if you study the book of Acts from chapter 1 all the way to chapter 28, you discover that the book of Acts is a supernatural book, right? It's the supernatural, there's the prophetic, signs and wonders, there's the angelic, right? In every chapter, I mean, it's the same with the Gospels, right? In, in the Gospels, it was God in Christ doing the miracles, right? And then we take this huge theological leap into the book of Acts, and the God in Christ in the book of, in the Gospels is now the Christ in us, the hope of glory, doing the miracles. Amen. And if you're ever going to see the, the manifested glory like the early church, then man, we got to come back and do what they did, amen, in the first century. Now, if you read the book of Acts, you will soon discover that there are several demarcation points in, in, in the book of Acts, right? And these are transitional points. They are like when the church crossed over those transitional points, a shift took place and God propelled, He, he accelerated them into something called the greater. Hallelujah. Amen. And it's really important, right? I, I, ne I never saw this, but all of a sudden when God illuminated, all of a sudden I saw that these were very critical points in the church. Amen. The first shift we see is Acts chapter 6. And verse 1, it says that now in those days, the number of disciples were multiplying and there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists. 
Now, what was happening in Acts chapter 6 was unprecedented, all right? They went from winning souls to actually obeying the great commandment. Woo! Hallelujah, amen, which is like making disciples, amen, and, they, and understand that every disciple is essentially or potentially a new church or a new church plant or a new, new ministry. Come on, think about that for a few moments, right? So right in, in the midst of this explosive growth and multiplication, uh, a problem arose in, in the church, and it was a, it was a racial issue. There was a tension between the, the Hebrew-speaking uh, 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 Jews and um, the Greek-speaking believers, and it, was, it took a small thing like the distribution of food to escalate the problem. Now, the problem was already there, you understand? There was this, this, this racial issue in the hearts of God's people, man. And it took a small thing. The Holy Spirit allowed a small thing like that to escalate the problem so that He can deal with the issue or else the revival cannot not go on. The revival cannot go on. And so what they did was the apostles appointed seven faithful men, recognized as leaders in the church, and they commissioned them to oversee the business of serving the people and to ensure that it was equitable. In other words, they dealt with the situation wisely and justly, and that pleased the Holy Spirit. And when that was resolved, we see in verse 7 that, the, and so this is the cause and effect, right? Then the word of the Lord spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly, come on man, in Jerusalem, and a great number of priests were obedient to the Lord, right? The growth of the church was explosive, and not just the disciples were now being multiplied, they, were, they removed any barrier that might hinder the Holy Spirit from moving. Uh, uh, if, if, it was how they handled the crisis that pleased the Holy Spirit. Am I making sense to you? Amen? And so this is really important, right? Because uh, whatever issue is in the church, Sometimes it's dormant, but it's there. The Holy Spirit has a way to surface those things, to deal with those issues. And the reason for that is He wants to move the church into a higher ground. Amen. The second shift that we see is in the book of Acts chapter 10 and 11. And here we see the, the, the focus of the gospel shifting from the Jewish community to the Gentile church. And of course, you know, uh, the, there was a man called Cornelius and his household. They received uh, the Holy Spirit. Uh, they received salvation. It was amazing. Uh, it was a huge mega shift. And because of Acts chapter 10 and 11, we're all here today. Amen. That's when the gospel shifted from the Jewish community to the Gentile church. And then in Acts chapter 13, we see another shift shift, we see a shift of power and influence from the Jerusalem church to the Antioch church. And we see the Holy Spirit launching, I believe, the greatest offensive that the church has ever known. Those three words, separate unto me. Woo! Hallelujah. Barnabas and Saul, the greatest missionary pair that the church has ever witnessed. And they were sent out and they created history, man. But I want to show you a subtle shift that took place in the church that I've never seen before. Now, Watch this because this is huge, man. This is absolutely huge. And it's in verse 32 of the scripture we read. Acts chapter 4, verse 32. Now the multitude of those who believe were one heart and one, one soul. Now watch this. Neither did anyone say that any of the things that he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. Now I don't know if you know how revolutionary this is, man. I, I, for the Holy Spirit to do a work in such a large community of people to bring them to this place where nobody said that all the things that they had was their own. No one claimed ownership of their own stuff. Boy, it has to be God, man. It has to be God. The early church was the most unusual company of people that ever existed. It was a community that, uh, that has never been witnessed before in history, never again replicated. But I'm telling you, I believe in the last days, God is going to have a, a church just like that and even greater. Hallelujah. Jesus is coming back for a bride that's totally free from selfish ambition. Amen. Now, right from the start, the early church witnessed the power of God. Is that correct? Acts chapter 2 and onwards, all, they, they witnessed the power of God, okay? But watch this transition, right? Because this is when power becomes great power. This is when grace becomes great grace. This is when signs and wonders become great signs and wonders. This is when multiplication becomes great multiplication. And yes, this is when persecution becomes great persecution. In the next verse, in verse 33, watch for the transition. Watch it. It says, and with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them. 
that word grace is inserted in the narrative. Everything was upsized. Everything was supersized. It's like God magnified everything, right? That word grace is going to appear again and again after Acts chapter 4 and verse 32 as if to say God was saying, because you have learned to live selflessly, because you have learned to love one another, because you have learned uh, to give yourself to one another in this community and form a true community, I will magnify and I will amplify everything in the church. Now, this was the point when God added the prefix great to everything that they were doing. It's like He upsized everything, right? What shifted? They became one. The moment they became one heart, one soul, one mind, one people, Woo, I tell you, something happened. And what was removed from the church? Selfishness. Selfishness. They became selfless. Nobody said that anything they had belonged to them. And everything became shared properly. Come on, man. Is this possible in our church? Is this possible within our communities? Is this possible? Is this something that God can do in our generation? Amen. There was no more need. Hallelujah. The rich took care of the poor. The strong took care of the weak. Hallelujah. Amen. And they discovered the beauty of we, not just me. Not what is in it for me, but we, hallelujah, amen. Can we imagine something like that ever happening in our community today, amen? Now, the early church came to a place where they lost all sense of self and everyone lived for everybody else. And I think that this is what heaven is like, really. Because when we go to heaven, you know, there's a complete eradication of self and, uh, you know, and uh, everything is freely given to all to enjoy the rivers of living water. We can all drink from the springs of life. We can all smell from the leaves of the, that are the healing for the nations and eat from the fruit of the trees. Uh, it's all free. Freely we have received. Freely we have given. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, the word great appears about 40 times in the, in the Acts of the Apostles. It's an adjective. Uh, it is a superlative uh, to describe something unusual, something, something numerous, something large, something first-rate, something exceptional, amen? And it comes from the Greek word megas, where we get the word mega, all right? Now, we're all familiar with the word, you know, mega sale, mega malls, mega discounts, uh, megatron, hallelujah, mega church, amen? Uh, but in the reference to the New Testament church, it appears seven times, about seven times. And each time des describing a phrase a face, rather, that the church was going through. Don't miss it, right? This is the cause and effect. Because they became so knitted as a community, because they became so selfless, God added a prefix to all that was happening. So instead of power, they had great power. Instead of grace, they had great grace. And signs and wonders, they had great signs and wonders. And there's a shift that took place, right? So what's the point? The point is if we can replicate the same community of selflessness, I believe that this, this great thing, this great is going to be added in all that we do as well. Now, how do we become one heart and one mind? It starts, I think, individually with each of us learning to take up the cross, learning to let the Holy Spirit crucify the self. Not so much sin, but the self. Amen? I think sometimes we deal with the issues of sin in our life, and rightly so. But there's also the issue of self from which sin originates. Amen? That has to be crucified. You can't crucify sin. Sin has to be washed by the blood of Jesus. And only one way you can deal with sin is by confession. It comes out by way of the mouth. We confess and the blood of Jesus cleanses us. But self is a different thing. You can't cast out self. It has to be crucified. And so carrying the cross, taking up the cross to follow Jesus is vital. Right? And uh, if we can live selflessly, individually, then corporately, I think we can come to this place. Amen. Now this, I believe, is the church of his dreams. This is what God has been longing for. I've always wanted to live in a community, man. This has been one of the great dreams. That's why I love going to our college. We have a college in, in Wales, the Bible College of Wales, um, where we, we have a community of people. It's amazing, right? And I think, we, we, I think that this is duplicable, uh, something that we can duplicate. Amen. Now, let's focus on the major things, eh? not the peripheral things in life, right? I think we should be done with lesser things, amen? And the, the, the focus is on the love of God, amen, which is really measurable if you think about it. If you, you, know, if we, you, if you know all about the blood moons and the Shemitahs and all about the signs of the times, but hate your brother, what's the point, right? I mean, what's the point of it, right? You, can, you know when you buy a, a nice uh, uh, ring uh, for your wife, you go to a jeweler store, Right? and you, you choose the, the diamond or the stone that you want, they would take the, 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 the precious stone and they often put it 
on a black velvet cloth. And the reason for that is that cloth accentuates the brilliance of the diamond or whatever stone that you are planning to purchase. And this is Isaiah 60, all right? That in the darkness, gross darkness, that one day that, that will cover the earth. But understand that this is just the backdrop. Amen. It is to accentuate the brilliance that is going to come forth from the church. You know, star shines brightest when, they are, when the sky is darkest. It's the principle of contrast. Amen. And as the world gets darker, I tell you this, the church will become more and more glorious as bitterness and hatred increases. The love of God in His people is going to start to stand out. And this is going to happen in our generation. I believe this with all my heart. Jesus is going to have a church full of glory without spot and wrinkle. Now, let me come to the seven things that the Holy Spirit magnified very briefly, all right? Because they so please God. Number one, great power. This is Acts chapter 4, verse 33. And great power, the apostles gave a witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. It wasn't just power. It, this is the first time the word mega is used, and it's used to describe the power of the Holy Spirit in the church. Now, the Greek word for power is dunamis, and Jesus said you shall receive dunamis, this power, P-O-W-R, when the Holy Ghost has come upon you. This is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's an endowment of power, amen. And I tell you this, a church without the power of God is an enigma, man. Come on. It's not supposed to be that way. It's not normal, amen. It's not normal. But when the church comes together in a greater unity and oneness, the ch God was able somehow to magnify the intensity of the power uh, to, um, to mega power. He upped the wattage. And we're not just plugging into 220 volts, man. We're plugging into the very power of the life source of the universe. Hallelujah. Now, the Holy Spirit does not exaggerate. Right? <laughs> He's the Spirit of truth. When He says great power, you've got to know that the very powers of hell themselves are, sh are, sh are were being shaken. Amen. Uh, in, you know, in John chapter 14 and verse 12, Jesus said these words. He said, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever believes in me, the works that I do, uh, he will do also, and greater works than this he will do because I go to my Father. Hey, come on, man. This cannot be wishful thinking, man. This has to be a reality. Jesus is not teasing us here uh, with something that is elusive or unreachable. Let me just say something about power and authority so that you'll understand. All right? There are two different concepts. Both are entering and God wants us to grow both in power and also in uh, authority. Authority is delegated. When Jesus rose from the dead, He said, all authority has been given to me. He said, go now in my name. And He, he delegates the authority to us. All right? But He doesn't just delegate authority. He has also given us power which is dunamis. Now, the best illustration is like a policeman. When he leaves his home in the morning, he puts on his uniform and his badge. And that's his authority. But he also puts on his taser, his pistol, or his baton, or whatever he does. And that is the power. Amen? His badge and his uniform is the authority, the, the pistol and the revolver. That's his, his, um, his power. Amen? Now, when a person sees the uniform and the badge, they should respect it. They should respect his authority, but sometimes that authority is challenged, and that's when the, the policeman whips out his, his revolver or his baton uh, to, to, re to reinforce the authority, to back up the authority. And of course, if that is challenged, he can radio in, and soon you'll have a whole bunch of policemen uh, and, uh, all ready to quell whatever is the rebellion, amen, or the opposition. Uh, the, the authority that Jesus gives to us is our badge in our uniform, amen? And, uh, but the, the power... Is the Holy Spirit, right? And the Holy Spirit is greater than all the power of the enemy. Now, don't miss this, my friends. The key to greater power is not just in more prayer or more fasting because sometimes, you know, everyone makes, the, I make the mistake, oh, man, if I can pray more, if I can fast more, I will have more power. No, no, greater power comes and is activated when we learn how to truly love one another. The key is love. I tell you this, my friends. When you learn to love selflessly, there's something that's generated in the heart of God. It moves towards you. Amen. And I tell you, we, we, we want, I sometimes wonder whether we're too impressed with the power of the devil because we have the greatest power, the most amazing, uh, unimaginable power, and it's in the church today, and we need to see it released. Hallelujah. Amen. The second thing that God magnifies is grace, great grace. And not only was there a shift in power, but there was also a shift in grace. It says in verse 33, the second part, and great grace was upon them all. Now, grace is given to us that we may, uh, in order for us to uh, overcome every situation and every trial that we're in. Amen. And 
the, the, it's, it's divine enablement. All right? God knew that great persecution was coming, so He gives the church great grace. Amen. Uh, we cannot be victorious, of course, without grace, and that's Romans 5, 17, right? And I tell you this, there's not a single subject right now in the Scripture that's being attacked more than the subject of grace. It's being abused and attacked. It's been twisted to such a de degree that many people now believe in a grace that, that hardly resembles the grace that is in uh, the Bible, all right? And great, but, but we need to come back to the true definition of grace, right? Great grace was given to the early church because great persecution was coming, and with that grace, they could overcome whatever the trials. Remember, Paul, of course, was given a, a, a deluge of revelation. Remember in this, uh, in Corinthians and uh, Second Corinthians, and, um, and then uh, less, he got puffed up with pride, uh, God sent him a messenger of Satan. That was a gift to Paul. And the messenger of Satan buffeted Paul, and Paul, three times with charismatic fervency, cried out to God for this, uh, for this uh, thorn in the flesh, he calls it, to be removed. Obviously, it was something physical. And uh, the Lord says, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. When God gives us grace, it is to bear whatever is coming. So that's really important, right? Number three, great fear came upon them. In Acts chapter 5 and verse 11, so great fear came upon the church and upon all who heard these things. And man, this has to return to the church, the fear of God, you know. In the early church, people were afraid of God. Uh, they were afraid of the God of the Christians. Today, they mock Him. Today, they mock Him. People were afraid to join the church uh, in the Bible because they got struck dead when they blatantly lied. Wow, a sin, right? Today, people don't fear the church because the church don't fear God. And I, I tell you this, we have to bring back the fear of God in the church. Again, the psalmist says, the fear of God is clean and endures forever. Amen. And we're often told, you know, oh, pastor, we must not be afraid of God. That's just cockamamie nonsense. I tell you this, fear is reverence. Yes. It is also honor. Yes. It is also respect. Yes. But it's also fear. It is also fear. And this is the number one reason why the church don't take him seriously today. Because many people think that he's got a kind of a wimpy God sitting on a rocking chair like a grandfather who will never judge, punish, or discipline us. And that, and, um, and that is a wrong picture of who God is. We need to come back to a true biblical picture and, and verify God's actual ID. Hallelujah. Amen. Now what precipitated this mega fear of God was the episode with Ananias and Sapphira. In Acts chapter 5, they conspired against the Holy Spirit to lie to him. That's a dumb thing to do, man. That's a dumb thing. And they both fell down dead in the church. It was as if the Holy Spirit brought the church to a grinding hall and says, I, want to, I have to deal with this issue. Listen, my friends, handle finances with integrity, amen? The whole move of God almost came to a total standstill because of Ananias and Sapphira. They almost single-handedly scuttled the entire revival. Wow, this is serious, man. And we need, to, we need to expel greed and covetousness from our, our ranks. Amen. Number four, great multiplication, right? Acts chapter 6 and verse 7. Now when the word of God spread, the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. Now if we're going to see great multiplication, then we have to return uh, to uh, through New Testament discipleship. Amen. You know, there's a big difference between being a Christian and, and being a disciple. Uh, a Christian is someone who is saved, yeah? and he wants all the benefits of salvation, healing and prosperity and uh, blessings and uh, promotion. And, and that's all great. That's all wonderful, right? But there must come a point in time where we don't just take and take and take like leeches, you know? We've got to start to produce as well, amen? A disciple, on the other hand, has a revelation that I've been so blessed by God. He's given me salvation and healing and the forgiveness of sins and provision and favor, you know, it's like the Psalm 103 man. He, he said, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless the Lord and forget not all his benefits. Man, he, he's, he's recounting all the great benefits, and he says, what can I do for you, God? It's, at some point in our lives, he takes up the decision to take up his cross for the rest of his life. He's somebody who has decided to deny himself and die daily to his selfish uh, desires. And I'm telling you this. There's something wrong with the Christianity that we have today, all right? I think if the apostles were alive right now, they would be, 
they would be scandalized, shocked at the, 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 how much Christianity has deteriorated in the past 2,000 years. The decline, the deviation, and the deterioration has primarily to do with the message that we are preaching over the pulpit. When we are telling people, man, you can be rich, you can be prosperous, you can enjoy life, man, have a great life. And you know, when you're when the, in the Titanic, the last thing you want to do is to tell people to renovate their rooms. Come on, think about this, right? Why renovate your cabin when you're on the tight? Listen, I'm telling you this. We must pre- have our eyes fixed on the unseen, amen? We must have our, our mindset focused on eternity, amen? The two most important days in your life is when you are born again and when you stand before God on that judgment seat. I'm telling you this. Every other thing falls short. These two are the most important days in your life. You will have to give an account of how you live your life. And I can tell you this. The majority of preachers today are far more interested in the number of decisions than the quality of converts. Now, both obviously are important, but we cannot negate the fact that we, we, we have missed out on the, on the discipleship of the church and we need to come back to that. Amen. We need to bring the church back to this. The cross is the centrality of all of us that we do as Christians. Amen. And if we don't make a decision at some point in our lives to fully embrace the cross by taking it up and following Jesus, we will not be ready to meet with Him when He comes back. Come on, man. I'm just speaking the truth to you. All right. At some point in your life, I believe that God will will speak those words to you, follow me. And you will have a choice. You will have to decide if you are going to follow Jesus or you just want to continue just to be blessed and enjoy the benefits of salvation. I tell you, there's no future for that man. Listen, I tell you this, my friends, you must take up your cross and follow Jesus. God is calling us into a greater discipleship. Amen. Most of us make the mistake of never counting the cost, you know, of discipleship. And anyone who does not take up his cross, Jesus said, cannot be my disciple. It's really essential for us to understand this. Number five, very quickly, great signs and wonders. Stephen, full of faith, it says in Acts chapter 6 and verse 8, and power did great signs and wonders among the people. Signs, miracles, wonders were so common in the early church that they had to distinguish between great signs and wonders and just everyday normal signs and wonders. Come on, man. When Peter and John walked up by that, uh, that, that uh, gate beautiful, there was a lame man uh, that everybody knew. And when they, re- when they healed the lame man, right, they said, silver and gold have we none, uh, but in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. Remember that man? He was begging for, he was asking for alms. He should have asked for legs, hallelujah. But anyway, uh, uh, what, it was called the gate beautiful, but what was, ha- was happening there wasn't so beautiful, right? But Peter and John raised that man. He started leaping and dancing. Never walked in his life. Is now he's dancing and uh, jumping. That's a, that's a notable miracle, right? That's the finger of God. And when Moses, remember, when he was challenged by the two magicians of Egypt, those magicians could do all the other lesser, the lesser signs and wonders, right? But they could not do the greatest signs and wonders. And they, they remarked in Exodus 8:19, this is the finger of God. Hallelujah. And this is what the church must shoot for. Not just signs and wonders, but great signs and wonders. So my question to you guys is, 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 is there signs and wonders already happening in the church? Is there miracles and healings flowing? Because God, that will prepare you for the greater works of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, one time Jesus uh, rebuked and pronounced a, 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 a curse on three cities, right? Capernaum, Chorazin, and Bethsaida. Why? Because after all the miracles that he did, they still didn't believe him. They still didn't believe him, right? And so they were judged by the, the light that they received, okay? Now, those of us who have been exposed to a lot of great teachings will be judged as to why we do not believe. Come on. We would be judged by, on why we, we acted the way we did, right? And Jesus said a remarkable thing. If these miracles were done in Sodom, uh, it would still be standing. What's the point here? The point that Jesus was giving us is the secret of how to reach a very large and wicked city, right? If you think of cities like Los Angeles, Amsterdam, you know, Bangkok and uh, Las Vegas, how in the world are we ever going to reach them? How in the world? The answer is signs and wonders. Signs and wonders and miracles, amen. I believe it's, if it's on the menu, then it should be in the kitchen, amen, hallelujah. Now, number six, and it says great persecution, Acts chapter 8 and verse 1, it says great persecution arose in the church that was in Jerusalem. I, I would be an unfaithful pastor if I didn't warn you of the persecution that's coming. The whole counsel of God includes persecution. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to see the escalation of persecution 
in the global church today, right? And it often subtly begins with discrimination, snide remarks, you know, the name calling usually leads to a loss of rights, of property, of freedom. And this is happening in many parts of the world today. And then the graffiti, the window smashing, the violence, the bloodshed, and of course, uh, violence in its most uh, horrific form, martyrdom, right? Is the church ready for this, right? Because we need to. And finally, it says in Acts chapter 8, verse 8, there was great joy. Not just joy, but great joy in the city. And this is what God is wanting to do in our generation. He wants to give us great joy in our hearts because the joy of the Lord is our strength. I want to close by praying for you today. This whole purpose is to, 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 to show you that if we, can, if we can somehow duplicate this community, if we can somehow learn to love one another selflessly, if we can learn to lay our lives down for one another, take up our crosses on a daily basis, and learn to live for one another and say, God, I'm a branch that I'm, that's rooted in, that's, that's connected to the vine. The fruit that I produce is not for myself, it's for people. It's for the needy people. And if we begin to have a heart for the poor and the needy and, and God does something and we take care of the, those in our community and form something of a New Testament community and love one another and, uh, and one, become one heart and one heart, one mind, one soul, then I think that we can position ourselves for the greater eternal purposes of God. Then we can pres- uh, position ourselves for the greater. Amen. And I believe with all my heart, God wants to add great to our power, to the power that He has already given to us. And I want to pray for you today that God will escalate this. He will, he will accelerate His purposes in your church today. Amen. Would you bow with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for this great church. And I pray right now in the name of the Lord Jesus for the power of God to be magnified in the church. I pray for this community that they will come to become one heart and one soul, one mind, Lord. And that, Lord, what you see in this congregation would please you so that you would add this word great to all that they're already doing. Hallelujah. That they would experience great power and great signs and wonders and great grace, Lord. They would experience great favor. Hallelujah. Great joy, Lord. And, uh, Lord, even uh, when it comes down to the chase, Lord, when we are persecuted, God, and great persecution is coming, Lord, that we can meet it with grace and with great joy as well. Hallelujah. So, Father, bless Bless these congregations, I pray. Bless your people. Bless them with every spiritual blessing. And may the power of God, the power of Christ Jesus be manifested in the church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, man.